TPN at technophilespodcast.com. I'm David Geisler, and this is the Technophiles Podcast. We have this phenomenon. We talk about the phenomenon of flashbulb memory. You know, when something either exciting or dramatic happens, um, there's the kind of where were you when this happened effect. This week, the cast meets with artist and senior lecturer Mark Tasman in the Digital Humanities Lab at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee to discuss the evolution of internet culture and the future of wearables. A selfie a day just might keep the doctor away because this is the Technophile's fourth live episode. All right, everybody, welcome to tonight's live show. I am David Geiser, the host of Technophiles, and I'm so happy you all could make it here tonight. Thank you very much. Um, we have, <laughs> I saw one hand go up as if, a, as if a round of applause was going to happen. I can wait. Oh, it's so organic. You know, that's, a, that's the nice thing about these live shows. It's just how organic they are. So um, let's see here. We're so excited to be here tonight. This is our fourth episode at the UWM Digital Humanities Lab, but this is our first episode for our eighth season. We've made a few changes this season. We have a new cast member. We're very excited about him joining the cast. And um, side note, he was actually, well, I'll say it when I introduce him. I'll, I'll save that little tidbit for when I introduce him. So for starters, I want to start bringing some of our cast members out. Um, I think I want to start with Crystal Lee, if that's all right. Crystal Lee, if you want to come up over this way. Round of applause for Crystal Lee. She's fantastic. <laughs> How you doing? Good, how are you? I'm well. So now, Krista Lee tonight is actually going to be waiting in the audience. She's going to be sitting out there in the audience with this microphone. Yes. Um, because in, the, in part three of this episode, as some of you might know, if anyone has any questions, we'd like to go around and let people ask questions. And we try to answer them. If you get some thoughts during one of our topics that you think you might want to add something, you are certainly more than welcome to do that in part three. Krista Lee, you doing all right? We're good. All right. Also, do we want to mention, I'm going to live tweet it, so if anyone's super shy, they could tweet me a question. Whoa. I could bring it up. Whoa. That's, there's layers going on there. There are. Wow. Very there's meta. layers. Fantastic. So if you see Crystal Lee typing away, it's, she's, not, she's not, not interested. Quite the right. opposite. Right. All right. I'll go join you there. I'll give this mic to you in just a minute. All right. Thank you. I'll see you in a bit. Now, let's have V. Lobs come out. She is, she is our senior cast member right now. V, you can come right over here. It's OK. It's fine. You have a microphone right now. How you doing, V? I'm doing good. I just now realized that you are senior. You are. You are. Uh, you've been with us the longest at this point, right now. That's so crazy. That's awesome. It's been a blast. <laughs> V's been with us a little, almost a little over a year. If I had to guess, I could look at a calendar, but it's getting close. Yeah, almost two years, I would say. Yeah, but really, honestly, I think that I might started be. like last winter, and now we're I think in the second winter of this uh, that I've been here. Yeah, that's wonderful and very exciting. Uh, v, thank you so much. We'll yeah. chat in just a second. And obviously, we're going to have our next cast member come out. Now he's brand new to us. He's only been in maybe five of our episodes so far in this season, but technically he's been in six episodes because this gentleman was actually our first live show guest here at the Digital Humanities Lab. We didn't know it at the time, but it, a, a spot opened up and we talked to Jake Gill, who can come out right now, and we were so excited that he was able to. You see right here, Jake? Good to see you, man. Hello, hello, good to be here. You're good already to be used to this part. Yeah. I am. <laughs> Except you sat there last time. Now it's, yeah, can I switch? it's a completely different world now, because <laughs> I don't think I can do it from the fourth chair. I'll be all right. He'll, 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 he'll hold on. It'll I'll be adapt. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going to have good company sitting next to you, because next I want to introduce our guest, who is a, uh, he's a senior lecturer here at UWM, UWM in the Department of Journalism and Advertising and Media Services. He's had a lot, a uh, number of art exhibits, one at the Milwaukee, or no, the Madison Museum of Contemporary Art. I believe, and um, he's won a number of awards, and he's, I think, our first guest to have his own TED Talk. I'm very excited about that little fact, and I'd like to introduce Mr. Mark Tasman. Mark, why don't you come on out? <laughs> You're welcome to here. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Mark. It's, it's genuinely a pleasure to be chatting with you tonight. We had a little meeting about a month ago, kind of figuring out what we might want to try to discuss, and I think we're going to really be talking about some great things. And I'm really excited. Me too. All right, very good. I'm going to go hand this microphone over to Krista Lee and walk on back and get this show rolling. Yeah. Here we are. Thank you. And an excellent walk back to the table. I Way practiced. Go, I practiced yeah. this morning a few times. Flawless. Like after the shower in the restroom, I was like, walk, walk. Oh, look, oh, okay, yeah, I got it. I yeah, think I got yeah. it. Don't trip over any wires. I got Completed. it. Oh, careful. Yes. We've got a mic down, I think, uh, down here. Okay. All right. Oh, let me God. see. Let me just get this thing organized. <laughs> Mark, how you doing over there? Wow. Great. <laughs> Great. Again, it's nice to have you here on the show. Thank you so much. Um, why don't we tell our audience, I, look, I've got a loose microphone adapter right here. I'm going to hold that thing. Why don't we talk about um, 
who the heck you are mm-hmm. and why we're so excited to talk to you. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. Okay. I'm Mark Tasman. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm an artist and a photographer, and I uh, most of the art that I've uh, done lately is uh, has to do with um, the nature of digital medium and um, networks, digital networks too. Absolutely. Um, I think of myself as a kind of media experimentalist, always uh, testing, um, trying to break things, not not really destroy them, but um, use them for. Um, purposes that they weren't one might say hack a little bit it's kind of a popular thing to say right now that's right sort of the old school version of hack Mm -hmm. that's right Mm -hmm. like a life hack but for stuff for stuff (laughs) i love it there's a lot of different stuff you've explored in your career now i want to ask i always like to ask when we we're we're so grateful to be able to do our live shows here at uwm and once in a while we are able to have our guests be people who are from uwm and when we have that i like to ask like how long have you been here how did you find this uh this uh college and everything this university yeah uh my wife and I moved here in 2001. That's some years ago. Math happens. 2001. 14, well, I think what? I think like 13, years, 14, 15? 14, 15. 14, 15. We're, we're the most smart on this podcast. Yeah. If you're we, listening we to this math. in the future, it's over 100 years ago. <laughs> Excellent. 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 In, in, um, We've had this podcast stored. When on this podcast is stored on the little disc yeah. that Jake had last week. <laughs> right. 300 terabytes on a stinking coin, yep. yeah. which was a previous episode, Mark. I apologize. We're doing yeah. a, we're doing we're a doing callback. Callbacks. And it's completely not even in the appropriate context. So <laughs> yes. um, you came here, so you've been here f- uh, a, a number of years now. Yeah, 15 years. And was that, have you always been working in the same capacity here? You've been a lecturer and things like that? I uh, came, uh, first worked, uh, for first couple of years, worked in um, the School of the Arts uh, and worked around town. Actually commuted back to Chicago and taught at uh, Columbia College, Chicago. Uh, Seriously? Yeah. I attended Columbia College. Yeah, oh. yeah. That's where I went for film. Oh my gosh. Okay, yeah. That's I was cool. there. I, I was there in 1999 and in... Uh, no, in 99? 99. I think it was fall of 99 and 2000 and then uh, through the fall of 2001. Mr. Mark Tasman. Yeah. 1999 is the year I went to Columbia College. Oh okay. my gosh. Wouldn't it be awesome if we walked past each other? Like We probably did. I was. Ago? I taught in the academic computing department. Amazing. There. Yeah, and Amazing. I did some performances You didn't take there. those classes, David? I guess I didn't. I think, well, it doesn't matter that much. I originally went for animation, but eventually it just turned in, after about a semester, it turned into a film a film major. Right, right. So I was down there on the south, in the south over by the theater building and the film buildings a lot. Okay, South Loop. I was in, the, I think, the 600 on, on Wabash. Yeah, absolutely. There. Cool. Yeah. So we're having our own little personal moment little, here. Little because Chicago, plenty of other people. <laughs> Chicago revelry. Well, yeah. that's very exciting. That's cool. Yeah. Um, so around what time did you do? I want to kind of jump right into um, this this ex- exhibition that you had in Madison, yeah. where I don't know if our listeners know this yet, and I was trying to save it from our cast members because it's such an amazing, cool thing that you did, but it kind of got leaked back there in our uh, very fancy green room before the show. Leaks. Leaks. Um, where did you get the idea to take a picture of yourself once a day, every day, for 10 years, and turn it into an art exhibit? You know, it started... I can remember, I was thinking about this the other day, I, I can remember being an undergraduate and um, thinking about what if I could take a self-portrait and um, s- correlate that to the phases of the moon and see like if my hair got crazy, if I had good hair days on certain days. <laughs> sure. I had long. I have a long beard now, but I used to have long, long, like um, flowing curly locks, kind of romance novel um, hair. <laughs> um, sure. Fabio hair. Yeah, Fabio hair. Yeah, definitely. Nice. Um, and so that was, I guess that was in the early 90s. I was thinking about that. And then when I got to um, graduate school, I was really... Oh my gosh, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I thought I was being so cool. I was trying to cue it up. Yeah, <laughs> you did. We can let it play, but keep okay. talking, please. Yeah, yeah. So I started in 99. Um exploring kind of these issues of identity and performance. I'm really a photographer, but what interests me a lot about photography is this uh, performative element that the photographer is not just a kind of, um, you know, cool, uh, objective observer, but a photographer, you know, you've seen a photographer at a party, he he or she has to work the room, you know, be very um, gregarious, make everybody happy to get the shots that they Hmm, want. That's interesting. You're right. Mm -hmm. So um, I didn't, uh, so I thought of myself as like, okay, a photographer performs, but, but how, you know, what about, you know, what about the performer? You know, how do we, um, uh, how does a photographer express those kinds of things? Now, it looks like you, you didn't necessarily, like, you know, do the close-up of the face every single day. There's obviously there's different experiences, different framing happening here. 
So so when did you start doing this? If it was 10 years, geez, was that like in the late 90s? 80s? Yeah, started in 1999, July 24th, sure. 1999. I think it was Jennifer Lopez's birthday. She turned Excellent. 30 <laughs> on that day. Okay. She was 30 years right. old No, it is. Yeah, a few years. <laughs> um, my senior. But um, yeah, started and didn't know when I first started, I didn't know exactly how long I was going to go for, but I just knew I was going to do it every day. Um, and, um, I was taking more than one a day cause I was trying to make these kind of, um, I was thinking about it like these little flip book animations or sort of graphic novels where there would be multiple portraits of, uh, characters that I was performing. Mm -hmm. Um, but then it, it got to be really, really hard to come up with a kind of new performance, a new, yeah. uh, character costume. I couldn't uh, help but notice you just had obviously maybe a couple weeks worth of just doing the profile for a little bit, and it almost presents itself as a single shot. Yeah, I've that moved. Are you doing lower frame? Uh -huh, I've moved to Milwaukee here. This is in two thousand one, um, and hmm. yeah, so um, some of it was like exploring, like how my hair grows. Some of it, like sometimes you'll see me pointing in my chest. I had like this is gross, but it's radio, so you can't see it. But it was like I would have a like got an infected they call them sebaceous cysts that are really really painful Ooh. sure um and so i was it's, then i was using this i was trying to figure out you know like does it happen every february does this thing happen right. every february and th this is a, it got oh. to be in a series of um every t taking a picture in front of the place where i slept the night before okay <laughs> and that's that kind of cool that was yeah. about a 13 month period there in My goodness. 2002, every day. 2003. Wow. 2003. Every day, every day. So you're about five You're about five years into this right here as we watch this on the screen right now. Well, the f I think I, like I would say about the first uh, two or two years or so, I was shooting more than one a day. And then once I sat, once I realized that I, I was really doing this for 10 years, there was no way in terms of economy of both, um, you know, money and space that I could average three a day for 10 years because that would be thousands yeah um, right and as it is i have a, there's about 4500 polaroids but they were taken on 3654 consecutive days that's a point i completely forgot these aren't yeah, these weren't just digital snaps these were polaroid What's pictures <laughs> yes <laughs> you, you can hold these right like yeah and this was instant and so i was operating by the sort of the conventional rules of the selfie where you hold the hold the camera but i had no way of seeing myself and so mm -hmm. I got very good at seeing my reflection in the little lens, like lining up my mm -hmm. eyes. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, and so I knew, and then one of these Polaroid cameras had a little timer on it so I could set it on a ledge and you know, it'd be like an eight or 10 second timer mm -hmm. and the light would flash. So you'll see some, I mean, this is inside my house at the front door. So that's the same background. So you I might be doing the, that for a few months or uh, something. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And then I think I move into a bathroom. Um, <laughs> So it's almost as if the really background nice. is animating a little bit, or at least you're exploring that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I was, it, it was mobile, too. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't, because there were a couple other oh, yeah. uh, people who were doing this at the same time. Ari Lee is um, the young woman who, um, she's older now. Um, <laughs> uh, who, just who, who, you're blowing, you're blowing my mind. So. Yeah. <laughs> she posted three years um, every day, and she had her eyes lined up, and then... Noah Kalina saw that, and he became sort of the most famous guy. He's the one who was parodied on The Simpsons, um, and he and they were all doing it like indoors with um, webcams or digital cameras. Mm -hmm. um, there's another fellow uh, by the name of Jonathan Keller who started in '98, but he stopped for six months when he went to Antarctica, and Ooh. so I saw myself as a kind of in a race. Yeah. with these three other people <laughs> to get to be the first one to get to 10 years and I won I mean if you choose to stop it yeah. takes yeah. a large commitment yeah, to start yeah. again he did it that's right yeah, yeah. he did it I'm gonna did go you, back over were here. there ever days where you're like I don't want to do this too. was it hard to get the photo every day yes yeah there, there were so, after a while it became just very um, kind of subconscious unconscious so you know a thing like brushing your teeth like mm -hmm. how many days do you go to bed and forget to brush your teeth or brush your teeth in the morning you've you've got your breath to remind you usually or that gritty feeling on your teeth mm -hmm. um but i gave myself a rule and i, I only used this rule probably a, less than a dozen times um where if i 
went to bed and forgot to take that Polaroid that day. I had a 36 hour rule so I could wake up like at three in the morning as I often did. My heart was pounding like, did I take my Polaroid today? I can't remember. And <laughs> I would get up and sometimes I'd check and be like, oh yeah, yeah, I did it. I did it. I totally took the Polaroid. But if I didn't, I would take it. And so it'd be the next calendar day, mm-hmm. uh, you know, so it might be, you know, February 26th, but then um, I would take another one that day. So, okay. um, but yeah, it got to be, so after the, those stages of kind of performing for the camera, or those in-between things, it was like the performance was taking a picture, me taking a self-portrait. Sure. So it was, it was very uh, much a, a kind of meta We've talked about Polaroid, the company, a few times on our show mm-hmm. because they go in and out of needing to update and sometimes not update and things like that. And there was, I know that there was a period of time there where they were not making much film. I mean, were there ever times where it was logistically difficult to pull this off from yeah. a from a from a material point of view? Yeah, they uh, declared bankruptcy and right. they quit making the film in two thousand nine, the same year that I stopped. So it was a it was Got a it. great um, sort of prescient um, sticking the landing like 10 years before like Mm -hmm. as if I knew really but um, (laughs) you know to say that um, you know digital stuff would replace this physical stuff but Mm -hmm. it was it was the same year and I have a picture up here of you I'm guessing at the Madison uh, yeah Madison Museum of Contemporary Art if I if I can tell you physically have every single one of these photos up on that wall don't you yes Yes, I do. What was the process of storing all those and making sure they were in order over the course of 10 years? Yeah, that's different than digital a little right. bit. Yeah. yeah, like there's got to be... You have timestamps with digital. You yeah. can just say, and please sort. Yes, yep. <laughs> yeah, sort by this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so I... Um, it's like write, a lot of shoeboxes. It's, it, <laughs> yeah. it, it's exactly <laughs> in shoeboxes. That's where they are right now, in shoeboxes. But I would write, um, I'd write the date on the back of it. And if I took more than one, I would write, you know, like A, B, or C, or sometimes the system changed. But a a lot of times I would go like for weeks or several months where the pol- where I just sort of stack up these Polaroids and mm-hmm. hope that the stack didn't get knocked over. <laughs> Whoa, playing with fire there. Yeah, yeah. But it was really interesting because it was very much also this kind of um, uh, scaffolding of my own memory. So I'd remember um, what it was that I was wearing. And if something did get knocked over, I'd be like, oh, yeah, this came before that. I, you know, I got this. I got this down. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's things that, I, you know, I st- flashing through there like, you know, the day that my son was born, all kinds of other things. Like I, these, I mean, we have this phenomenon. We talk about the phenomenon of of flashbulb memory sometimes, um, you know, when something either exciting or dramatic happens, um, there's the kind of where were you when this happened effect where um, things are sort of seared into our memory. But, but I was also interested in these other memories that happen um, that are just sort of the day to day things and, and what happens when those things you know, do they just slip away? I remember as a child, like watching, I don't know how old I was, three or five, but watching, seeing the sunlight sort of stream through um, my living room and s- watching the dust particles just sort of float through those things. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's no photograph of, of that, but I remember it. It's some, somehow. Um, sure. I, I, and I don't, I couldn't tell you the date exactly mm-hmm. when it happened, but I could tell you the date of, of some of those some of those things. It's just amazing. And it's such an interesting, um, not even counterpoint, but balance to some of the things you study now. It, I mean, you're, the, the spectrum here of the way you're looking at things is really quite broad in a very exciting way. So right now, you're, you're, um, what are some of the things that you're focused on these days? Because I know that you and I chatted a little bit about um, it's kind of what's happening with internet culture and a little bit of this, this you know, media and how it gets remixed and stuff like that. I actually have a video here that I want the, the the rest of the cast hasn't seen this. Is this your students that made these, or were these just videos that you wanted to point out to me? The, uh, those are that yeah, those are student projects from from the class that I teach. Uh, it's called Media Graphics. Yep. And um, yeah, we do a, a kind of it's a mashup project. They they in the sort of the last few weeks of class, they um, they're researching essentially viral media. So I'm asking them to to find. A video um, that's compelling to them and figure out where it came from who made it how it was made uh, how it spread what and uh, basically analyze why they think it spread 
and then every, so everybody does their own research paper on the viral media and then I ask them in groups to sort of get together and think about if they if they could mash up um, you know two or more of these things right um, you know what what would that look like because of course one, what comes with the internet is taking media and and owning it again and remixing it and mm-hmm. making it something new and I am not interested tonight in discussing any of the, any of the legalities of that because that's a conversation that'll go on forever <laughs> yeah. but I'm very interested and this is why I was excited to talk to you to talk about kind of the humanity of that a little mm-hmm. bit you yeah. know and what's happening when information gets shared so fast or remixed or a meme even just happen you know some basketball player throws a ball in a weird way and then that becomes a meme and then all of a sudden there's cats doing it and then there's like other people performing it as a dance and then it gets remixed into a song and this all can happen in 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 a matter of days sometimes hours and i think i think that's prob i think that's beautiful i think that's probably a beautiful thing you know mm-hmm. and you get a lot of weird stuff that comes out of it but yeah. that way that 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 you know if you can think about artists being in a studio together and they can bounce off each other real quick i think the internet has done that for the world a little bit and i get the sense that those are the kind of things you're exploring as well yeah yeah i'm really interested in this idea it's kind of um i guess maybe one of the uh, grounding theories would be intertextuality where um you can think about an idea, even a word, right? A word means something um, uh, to everybody. And um, it has a kind of um, sort of attachment or other meaning with it. And when you mix it up, when you use it in a, a new way, anytime we use a word, that uh, a new word that we've learned, we're, we're bringing it from one story and putting it into our own story. Mm-hmm. And so these things, and I've felt this way for a little while or noticed that um, more and more this kind of audiovisual media, especially in the age of this kind of ubiquitous digital information, it's so easy to um, remix that, to make it, to send it, to communicate. And the, the, the faster that we can sort of remix and fire these things off, the more it becomes um, vernacular and part of our language. Yes, mm-hmm. absolutely. And we, mm-hmm. I mean, we totally see it with um, emoticons. Uh, you're right. You know, like we, you know, the hands clapping or yeah. thumbs up or, you know, a uh, lady in a fancy dress holding a wine glass, <laughs> yeah. you know, like, like that expresses something. We might not know what it means, but mm-hmm. um, yet, um, but we will after we use it so many times. And that's what's happening with media, you know, to sample something from a movie and to mash it up with something that a basketball player did. Or, right. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Well, let me, let me cue this up. It might take a second to load, but I really don't think it will. This is, some of these are adorable. Some of these are ridiculous. And that's what the internet gives us. And we'll watch a few of these real quick. Yeah, I'm sort of excited to see what shows up This might up take here. a second. And I don't know where the volume's at, but I mean, I don't know if it's high or low. Yeah. Oh, I should say that um, yes. there's, there's a challenge. So they, they have to release these in the last, like the last day of class. And then I give them a week. Um, they have a week basically to drive up their view count on these videos Ooh. to a thousand views. Whoa. They can get a thousand views in that one week period. Then they get an A automatically. I sort of throw the oh. I, Mark. That's awesome! I, oh my god! I throw the grading structure out the window. I say you won. I don't have to grade this. Do, do they ever say like what their strategy was? If they said, well, I don't know. I just tried this. Or I, I mean, that's, wait, let's talk about that after we watch. It. Sure, sure. Let's watch yeah. some videos. Let's do this. <clears throat> See if we can guess it's which one's got Insta A's. I got it. <laughs> what? <laughs> right. <laughs> this is great. Oh boy. Kittens! Inspired by kittens! <laughs> I'm going to turn this up. Oh. Goosebumps already. <laughs> Take my money. <laughs> I hope everyone can hear it. You have forgotten who you are and so forgotten me. <laughs> Look inside yourself, Simba. You are more than what you have become. You must take your place in the circle of life. How can I go back? (laughs) I'm not who I used to be. Remember who you are. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> oh, Open no, the box. Yes. Go! It's my dick in a box. I think we have a, so one more here. Oh, one more, yeah. Oh, he's whispering, but... It's real quiet. I'm sorry, I can't make it any louder. Let's see, I don't know if we're... We may not hear this one. The volume's one? low. Well, he's playing 50 Cent right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they're all nodding to it. And it's a great scene in the original movie, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, he's like, I will now I sell, sell five records of... Uh, five yeah. copies of... The Beta this, Band or something. The Beta yeah. Band, yeah. yes, yes. <laughs> well, the audio is just a bit low on this one, but we can, uh, we can call it there. So, Mark. David. Thoughts? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So this was I, this is over the last year. V, what's going on here? You're I reacting. I love that rock one so much. The rock one's great. <laughs> the rock. I love the kitten uh, screams. Eh. Yeah, I love tiny children screams over giant muscly bodies. That's mm -hmm. that's. Um, that's a formula for you. Yeah, that works for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you start you start up a vine or something. Yeah. V, did you recognize kittens inspired by kittens? I I have never actually seen that one. I'm familiar with the rock being uh, ridiculously charming and um, almost frighteningly muscular. Um, but I'm not familiar with Kittens Inspired by Kittens. Well, I don't know where that one's from. That was a thing. You'll have to look it up. But Kittens Inspired by Kittens was, it was a, a little girl who opened up this book called Kittens. And she says, Kittens Inspired by Kittens. And then she goes through and sort of voices over all these, <laughs> you know, cuddly kittens and playful poses. <laughs> and it was actually, the girl's father worked for a... Uh, um, an ad agency and so he helped to create it but it went viral in the late aughts the 2000 something really? years yeah yeah wow yeah so th some of these are like kind of deep cuts i guess you could say yeah deep deep viral videos yeah old, yeah. old viral memes. yeah uh, yeah so, so as you explore this with your students what does it all mean for you or do, are you finding where it goes yeah well we spend the uh, just about the entire semester looking for deep meaning, like their first project is about, um, ask them to think about the future and what are their concerns for the future and, um, you know, how can they help to create a better world by visualizing it or visualizing a terrible uh, dystopia and saying, let's not go there. Um, and then I have them work on other kinds of activist things. Um, and so by the time we get to this viral video thing, like we've spent so much time talking about um, meaning and um, ethics that I just say I just sort of take it pull it off and I say what you know what are the ethics of you know viral media um, you know how, how do ideas uh, sort of spread most mm -hmm. quickly and fiercely uh, <laughs> through our networks mm -hmm. uh, Absolutely. and often so and they have to think about like whether they're going to spam their classmates or their you know all the people just by you know, blatantly asking, I need a thousand views, watch my video, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or uh, leveraging other um, networks that they might have, like going onto Reddit or um, mm -hmm. other, you know, Instagram or uh, Twitter, mm -hmm. um, Facebook, virtual communities. Um, but in the end, they have to uh, produce something that's um, quality, like it has to be good yeah. or else it's just going to sink anyhow. Yeah. It's, uh, the Hawkeye Hates Children one was timed perfectly because... <laughs> That's they, my favorite. Oh, I got to be that honest. That's really my favorite. Yeah. Yeah. Hawkeye Hates Children yeah. is so good. They, they released it. It was this... They released it the weekend before the... Um, the What's the name? Was of it the, Avengers, the Avengers 2? Avengers, yeah, it came Voltron? out. Yeah, so it was also... They also used this principle called currency, which is like it's current so mm -hmm. people are going to be searching for it. Yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, I've, yeah. I've had a couple of experiences with that when I was in high school um i did like a fake trailer for um a scott pilgrim movie like me and my i did it as like a class project we were supposed to make a trailer film stuff and this was like the year before the scott pilgrim movie was even like in production and so we made this trailer and put it on youtube and thought whatever and then all of a sudden the views on it just 
spike because they had just announced that they were adapting the comics into the movie and they were sure. immediately hitting YouTube going Scott Pilgrim movie trailer and they keep kept finding my video and watching a bunch of high school dorks run around and pretend to be from Canada. It's true. <laughs> nice. Even on even on our YouTube page, we have a couple Star Wars episodes and you can actually map when the trailer came out, when the movie mm-hmm. came out, right. when the announcement of the next trailer came out, you can see that on our on their views and it's yeah. it's just fascinating how that works. Mm-hmm. So, we're about to go to break, but I can't resist. Let's watch Hawkeye one more time and maybe the, <laughs> maybe the kittens as well now that we've turned it up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah, timing is is always really really important. Oh god, no volume. Oh, no at audio. All. Oh, I messed it up. You messed it up. I've been turning the audio it. off. <laughs> Here we Mark, go. Well, well, David is messing with that. Do you, did, you, did a lot of students meet the 1,000? Hawkeye had 10,000 views. Ooh. Yes. That broke did the Did you give them like 1,000 the extra A's? <laughs> oh, here we go. <laughs> And then here comes the rock. We'll watch the rock now that we've got the volume uh, up, and then I'll cut it. <laughs> Get your heart out, V. Inspired by kittens. Bow bow, chicka bow bow, chicka bow bow. <laughs> just too weird. Very nice. All right. Anyway, so Mark, we do have to go to break, but I'm excited to come back because um, I also know that in our next uh, part, we're going to be talking a lot about wearables and what they mean for the future and how people are interpreting wearables. We even have a few examples of how people have in some ways hacked the way they might use their GPS to actually create art, things like that. We have a couple examples of that. I know you, are you do you have your wearable on right now? Uh, always. You're going for... Like, I'm on a streak. Since September 1st, I've hit my step goal every woo-hoo. every day. 10,000? It's, yeah, it's not that hard. I did it for 10 years before with a Polaroid. So. <laughs> right, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. How hard is walking yeah. compared to that? Yeah. So we will, um, we will come right back in a few minutes, and I can't wait to talk about all of that. We're going to talk a little bit about Facebook and uh, virtual reality, a little bit of health wearables, everything. Cool? Exciting. Love it. All right, we'll see you in a bit. Rock and roll. Uh, <laughs> oh, it happened! I triggered it! I triggered it! I didn't mean to! I was thinking out loud saying okay, but it worked. We're back, we're in it. And Mark, I don't know, why don't we just jump right in here? We're going to talk about wearables in this second part. There's a lot of things that are going on with wearables right now. There's a lot of different ways that wearables are affecting our life. Some are, as I kind of said in part, was before we went to the break in part one, some are simply logging steps, which is Im- impressive enough. Some are potentially altering the way we experience things. Um, what I know, I, you and I, we kind of geeked out a little bit on wearables because I like, I, I, you know, I really get excited to like use GPS when I go biking. I really get excited to log m- the caffeine intake that I have every day. I really get excited about having a phone record my sleep and stuff like that. But maybe it's a little bit like with the Polaroid thing where you were talking about where it's. That, the fact that you slept for six and a half hours that one day, that's not interesting. But the fact that you can look at a year or two and see trends, that's very interesting. Right. And I'm, I'm now, as I'm thinking out loud, guessing that that might be what's attracting you too to these kinds of things. So, Mark, what's attracting you to these kinds of things? Yeah, yeah. I think it is that idea of, um, or at least the practice of self-quantification um, to, to create a, another body, uh, a reflection uh, that's data um, and data that I can control, not necessarily, you know, my credit card numbers and spending right. habits. Mm-hmm. Right. But that is another uh, aspect of, of uh, I guess, you know, self-quantification is looking. I mean, that's something that we probably all have done at some point is like balanced the checkbook or made sure that we weren't spending more than we were bringing in every month. And if you translate that into, um, you know, calories, steps, you know, food that you're taking in, uh, amount of steps that you take in, calories burned, et cetera, those kinds of activities, then it it's just sort of makes sense. It's just all part of the kind of uh, our body economy. Our, our Absolutely. I was, as you were talking about it, too, I was thinking there was a few years there where uh, at least two or three times a day I would record my heart rate. And I noticed at a certain point, like, it went significantly more relaxed of somewhat recently. Yeah. And I was kind of like, I think that might be right. 
Yeah. I think that's kind of interesting. Yeah. It's cool to see that stuff. Yeah. We don't, I mean, we don't always know um, what it means or what we're doing it for really. But um, like those Polaroids, I didn't know exactly what I was going to do with them, but I knew that just sort of collecting that data would give me um, some idea, a way to tell a story. Right. Absolutely. You need the, you need the data first. You need to collect it and then you can think of different ways to interpret the data or Mm -hmm. kind of suss out what's been going on. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. It is kind of backwards. You don't necessarily sit there and say, I need to know my heart rate for the next five years. But if you kind of do it, all of a sudden you you, you you might. Well, it could be an indirect effect of just the things that you're doing. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, I have. That's true. I mean, with the technology we have, not even deliberate wearables, but just so many phones now, right? They'll tell you, you you did this yesterday. You walked this way. Like they can do so many different things just from that data. And then you can go back later and be like, Oh my gosh, this is really interesting. I didn't even know this was going on because mm-hmm. it's just being tracked, mm-hmm. and we have weird power stuff happening. Yeah, I, mean, I saw that too, but it's okay. We're all good. I all think right, it's good. probably just a. I think it's a wiggly wobbly uh, HDMI cord. Okay, okay. great. <laughs> I don't know if it's exactly timely wimey, but it's definitely wiggly wobbly. It's happening over timey wimey. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this that, this idea of observation though is I think relatively new in the history of humans. Uh, you think about like Renaissance how. The Renaissance changed the way that we made art. There was a perspective system that came back in after the medieval period where artists would copy other artists. Um, and so this idea that information or data is basically how we discover truths about the world is, I mean, you know, 600 years is sort of a long time, but not, not really in thinking about um, all of humanity and how mm-hmm. long we've really been here doing stuff making culture Mm -hmm. um and i think probably in you know i don't know the last 20 years or so part of this kind of digital internet uh revolution that's that might be the byproduct of it but it's it's all caught up in this these notions of privacy security um what we share what we don't share Mm -hmm. Um, You're right. I mean, there's that thing about how like Google, if you run any Google app on an Android or an iPhone or anything, they can tell you your history of where you went and what you did. And they can even deduce things about where you went and what you did. And we did a whole episode about that. We didn't necessarily think about it positively or negatively at the time. It's just we were just trying to explore that that that's possible because there's so much data. And then I don't want to derail us, but then you have, like, if we're worried about security, you have even, like, the FBI Apple phone stuff right now, or iPhone stuff right Hashtag now. Hashtag Apple FBI. <laughs> <laughs> um, Get that in there. But, uh, well, Crystalline, uh, every, we had an episode about it just recently. Mm-hmm. But um, this is something different. I, I think, like, it's so fun to collect all this data, and I think some really good things can come out of it. I, 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 pr- I prefer to not get too freaked out about it because, you know, the Apple and iPhone thing, that's a different, that's not collecting data that is something different yeah um so you record your steps would you have a fitbit there i think it I, looks like i have a jawbone up jawbone. too really? yes Whoa. which isolates me from all of my other friends who are on fitbit right so oh. this is a this is an issue for me and i've sort of been exploring some other platforms where we can cross over and talk to each other but i really really like the interface the the, the app interface on the uh the phone. This thing doesn't tell me anything. Like it'll buzz when I hit ten thousand steps and lights will flash. Yeah. <laughs> but I can't see how many steps I have. It doesn't tell me the time. It doesn't tell me my heart rate. Wow. It's just like measuring when I swing my arm. Just yep. bare minimum. Yeah. Wow. Which is sort of nice because I don't like, I don't like to be, um, you know, like distracted all the time with the buzzing and the. Uh, sure. You know, I, <laughs> like I like to sort of turn off. Um, I like the physicality of having this thing and knowing that I have it set to buzz if I've been inactive for 30 minutes. So like I'm sitting at the computer and it buzzes and it's like, you've been sitting at the computer hunched over like a Tyrannosaurus Rex for too long. It's time to get up. And, and so I try to do that, but the more it buzzes or the older I get, the longer I wear this thing, the more habituated I get to the buzzing. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And I just you ignore like it. it off, totally yeah, ignore it's like it. a, like I snooze. Like yeah, I have the same problem. <laughs> yeah, you snooze it. I do. I do the noon like haptic buzz. Hey, it's noon. Are you wearing? Are you wearing? What are you I, wear? I, 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 Fitbit. Yeah. Fitbit. Now, Jawbone and Fitbit, they kind of started off on similar trajectories, and then Fitbit, for some one reason or another, caught on. And not to start a fight with you two gentlemen over there or anything, <laughs> but uh, Jake, what drew you to the Fitbit? Um, we had a friend who um, 
got an employee discount and was like, hey, we can get these for really cheap. I mean, and sometimes that's how the battles are won. Yep, it's yeah, like, yep, a, you yep, know, yeah. HDVD and Blu-ray, that's how it my, was won. My, my sister like also had idea. one. She was, she was a fan. So I was like, oh, we can challenge each other. Mm-hmm. Although ooh. I think she stopped wearing hers right when I got mine. And does anybody, any, ooh, does anybody her out else here? Right now? Um, <laughs> that sounds like a challenge. Oh, that's <laughs> real. <laughs> Anyways, real. Yeah, um, I, does I, 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 I was going to say, I was one, maybe I'm asking the same question, but I wonder if people are wearing wearables out there and who's wearing what. Any, but let's start with the cast. Is yeah. anybody else here? I'm not wearing a wearable, but I do. I use my phone. Yeah. No. You know? I don't, I don't have any kind of wearable, and the only thing I track of like fitness or anything is just push-ups. How many push-ups I can do in a day? I've talked about this before. It's just an app where it like gradually increases how many push-ups you Does do. Does it record? Do you have to like and it put it in it. your mouth? And- no, it it just it's the trust system. It's like, all right, oh. do this many. Did you do it? All right. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got yeah. it. What's your target goal? Um, by it, the program it has you at is like a hundred by the end of the month. A hundred all at once. Yeah. It like it gradually increases. It's That's like you're cool. building strength, so we'll add, we'll keep throwing more. And Where more. are you at right now? Trust I system. Can, mm, haven't been doing it for a few weeks. Oh, yeah, really and that's cool. a, you know that's another thing yeah. though. One of the pro, one of the things I know I think um, it, ha- it gives me reminders, but we were kind of we were just poking we're around. Promptly. We were poking no. around on the internet <laughs> for um, you know uh, topics that are happening right now, kind of with wearables and stuff. And Crystal, I know you found an article that was talking about how sometimes the problem with wearables, and wearables means a lot, but with some wearables is that people use them for three months and then they stop or they forget about them or there's, it's too much of a hassle. Um, and I think that article was even talking about maybe ways to keep people attracted to them. What what drew you to that, that link that you sent us earlier? Um, I think, actually, that sounds like you're thinking of the one I brought to our episode a couple of weeks ago where there was the, the monetary... Well, no, no, it wasn't that. It was just that just one? yesterday, it was about like turning it into jewelry and things like that. Oh, that's the one you're talking People about. People didn't want to wear them, so it turned into jewelry. Right. Oh, it's like yeah. the trends for wearables moving forward, right? Yeah. It was... I actually found it a little bizarre. So, yeah, they, they made... It's a... Tr- it's a trend, so basically, instead of it looking like a Fitbit, instead of looking like a, a geeky tech thing, it looks like a metal bracelet, or it looks like designer jewelry. Um, but I found that odd, because I feel like with the popularity of these things, I feel like it is trendy to have a thing that looks like a wearable. So it's cool to but It's like a status symbol. A it's like, yeah. yeah, perhaps, one of but those like, people. The but one, thing, one of the things is, like, what happens when that that jawbone doesn't match your tie. Like, what do you do? Sure. You, can't, and you, maybe switch, that's what you switch the band. You dr- oh, is there a ba- can you do that? Oh, yeah. There's uh, like <laughs> hundreds of co- yeah. well, that At least for Vibbit, you get you got all like, your How should colors. I do my hair today? But what yeah, you could be I like, wear? you know what? I, this is like dressing down. <laughs> yeah. Are you just dressing black? Just black the whole time? Yeah. And then, yeah. Just, you know, yeah. You Ian Malcolm, the thing. Just black and gray, no matter what. Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, okay, fair enough. Um, I do want to kind of transition a little bit into some of this GPS stuff, because I know you shared some assets with me, things you wanted to point out. And maybe I'll just pull up an asset here, and I'll let you explain yourself. Sure. So we have a few <laughs> things here. Um, this is something that Mark sent to me uh, this morning, something that I could put up on the screen. And what is going on here, Mark? Oh, this is an artist, and I'm. Um, oh. Yeah, I'm blank. Yeah, I'm blanking on his name. Let me see if I can pull it up. You know, here. I think I actually have it in the file. Yeah, um, he's a Canadian artist, and. Is it Stephen Lund? It is Stephen Lund. Thank you. Yes. There you go. Um, yeah. So for a little over a year, he's been making these drawings, these GPS drawings. What does he call it? What's the name of his? This website? one's Unicorn. It's called... Um, These are like ride reports, right? From Stroke. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. but he has his own website, and he's, he's a doodle, GPS doodles, something like that. Sure. It's his website. We have another one we're going to show, too, in a second. Yeah, yeah. So he goes through town on his bike and makes these things. And I've thought about it. Like, I use RunKeeper, and, like, I try to make triangles when I run. But this guy <laughs> is making... Because, of course, the GPS is recording you. I, yeah. I record Every time I ride my bike, I record my GPS, and I love it. I'm not making shapes yet or anything like that. But there is one technical thing I want to point out here that he's very getting very, very clever. In order to execute the horn of this unicorn, he had to turn his GPS off and then turn it back on when he got up to that thing to uh, ping uh, one location, turn it back uh, off so that when he got over here... As you can see, then it, it, it uh, triggered again because those lines are not going over. That's a little hack on top of the hack. Whoa. 
Yeah. That's crazy. So we have a few others. Let me zoom out. I guess because it's a unicorn, we'll allow it, right? Because it's, yeah, yeah. I mean, what we'll else are you going to do? It's a magical. This is a, yeah, it's a magical. This is a know. Tumblr page that you sent me. Oh, yeah. This is uh, an, a different artist. His name is. Uh, is Wally GPX, yeah, he goes his by. Yeah, handle, yeah. And he's been doing it for a little bit longer, but I think he's also riding, uh, riding on his mountain bike. You can cover a lot more ground on a bicycle than you can on foot. Yeah. And maybe that's my problem is like I'm just uh, only trying to doodle with, uh, you know, like a few inches. Of... Do you ever set out consciously trying to do a certain shape or anything? I imagine these guys have to be mapping that out ahead of time and getting really excited about it. Yeah. I live on um, a boulevard, so I um, figured I could try to draw something that was long. So. Uh, once I noticed it looked like a gun, and another time I tried to draw a penis, but um, <laughs> it didn't look like either. Either oh. any looked like no. <laughs> it looked like the world's worst gun or the world's best. Gun. <laughs> yeah, because you would get these just sort of like it looks more like a pencil, like sure. you know, all yeah. the time. Sure, but I need more practice doing that, and yeah. you have to it, run a long like way. It's just like any other kind of drawing, you know. That's right. You, you start out with stick figures, and Wally then, GPX got and then, he got clever with this one, and then you start making tennis mm-hmm. players or something. You know, it sort of it probably depends on the the place. So he's in is he in where is he in Baltimore? I feel like I think mm, let's so, see yeah. if we can find yeah yeah his, la- his last Baltimore, one was yeah. Baltimore yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. um so th- that has a different system than um, um Stephen Lund who I think is in Vancouver he's in British Columbia so the the city that you live in also dictates the the quality of the marks that you can sure. make yeah. that it's it's your resolution is like what are the blocks right like how detailed yeah. can you like get that. yeah it's yeah. so your your dra- your resolution and or your just what your lines tools. can you work what what's your canvas look like yeah, right absolutely yeah. what's accessible what's not yep. cool yeah. wow too funny yeah that's so gnarly i that's Somebody's. it's that's i've it's funny to think of that as like a medium now you know you know, do you make you can make art well, here's out of so thing. much, and then it's just like, oh yeah, I used a, like a be- a bike route tracker app to make this piece of art. I think one of the good things that is coming out of wearables and tracking and all this kind of stuff is, you know, there's the I think usually the stereotype of going to the gym or working out or being healthy or whatever, usually there's the like, yeah, okay, you do it four or five times. And there's that one day where you make that excuse that you don't need to do it. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, you've already crossed that line now. Now, you know, you've already given yourself permission to make that excuse again some other time. Mm -hmm. And you go up and down. And and most of the time, I think for a lot of people, they just keep making the excuses. And then it and then ultimately you're done. You know, this is like the cliche of like join a gym for your New Year's resolution. And by February, you're not doing it anymore. I think what the tra- I like so I use a I use a motion I use a GPS app called Map My Map My Ride for biking and it does a thing where um, it will take your courses and it'll kind of crowdsource the data and it'll create its own tracks or routes or courses there's three different like calibers of this and so sometimes maybe specifically here in Milwaukee I'll just hit Hank Aaron and I'll be going out towards the zoo or something and there's a couple hill climbs there that enough people it, it's crowdsourcing the data enough people that use this app have done that that it creates like top 10 timetables of that hill climb oh, wow, wow and so um sometimes I'll be on a ride and I won't know this I'll be I'll just be doing my own little adventure because I want to go look at a river or come back down around and I get done and I look at my app and it says oh you were fifth fastest at this part or 20th fastest at this part mm-hmm. sometimes it's only sometimes it's just a hill climb sometimes it's like a two mile route through a park or something like oh. that and I tell you what the next time I'm on that hill climb, as silly as it is, I'm not even necessarily feeling competitive with these people, but it keeps me... It motivates you. It at least makes me not go, well, today's the day I won't do the hill so hard. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. It just pushes yeah. you over just enough. You don't have to become some kind of aggro weirdo, but it's just enough to keep you going. And I, I feel like these kind of creative expressions, people saying, well, I wonder if I could do drawings with my GPS, you know, things yeah. like that. It's it's just enough to keep it where you're not distracting yourself, but there's a there's a reward element, there's a creative element. You're not mm-hmm. just like, make the muscles happen. You know yeah. what I mean? Right. I think that's what can come out of wearables in a good way, personally. Yeah. Yeah. It gives it, it gives it more of a meaning. That reminds me of... Um, well, it's a shareable meaning, too. Yeah. It reminds me of um, you, you turn that physical activity into um, like an experience, um, whether it be artistic or like my mom really loves using this Zombies Run app where. Oh, I've done yeah, that. Yes. I, know. I think um, people know about it. It's been out for a while. I don't know if it's still getting updates or whatever, but you. It would, is. It's an, Tell us more, though. Oh, what I what is Zombies Run? Zombies Run <laughs> is an app where it's a running app. So you like tell it your route, how far you want to run today. Um, and it basically plays like an autumn, like a generated um, like 
audio drama in your headphones while you run where it sounds like you're getting chased by zombies. <gasps> oh, my God. And it'll God. tell you. It'll get louder. It'll get louder as they get closer. So it's like, run a little faster this time. You might turn a corner and all yeah. of a sudden, whoa. Yeah. And um, you can get, if you take certain routes, you can gather different items that are parts of the story. So, you know, it's like, oh, make a left here. There's like um, some food or shovels or something over there. Go pick those up. And when you come back, you, you know, drop them back off at base when you're done. So it creates the story, and it like mm-hmm. my mom was like really into it, like it motivated her, and now she was running like five Ks and stuff by That's the end of the summer. It it's, just, it's just enough to keep it fun, yeah. You know, because what's the alternative? I guess you kind of you have to create a running group or something like that. Not everybody can do that, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, you could run. You could actually call up a friend and say, "Hey, do you want to go for a run together?" Mm-hmm. Or do you want to chase me? And here's the thing. That's a great... <laughs> right, I mean, right, right. So, in a weird way, in a weird way, that's a great idea. It's just not always available. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, there's a version where maybe you could do zombie yeah. run with a friend, of course. You make, but, it, you make it a performance art where you and five friends, like, chase each other around with mm-hmm. some of you dressed as zombies. And... It reminds me of those... Remember, like, back in the... I don't even know if it was the 70s or the 80s or something. You'd, I had a friend who, down in the basement, they had an, an exercise bike. And you had these physical discs that you would click onto the bike... And the disc would rotate, and it would it would essentially move a dial up and down, and that dial would increase the tension, uh-huh. the friction on the wheel. Mm-hmm. But the disc was it was like go on the mountain bike disc, and you put the mountain bike disc on, and the character would go up and down these mountains as the mountains <laughs> pass. But really, that's just physically pushing this thing tighter and looser, you know. And I just thought that was the coolest thing in the world. But like <laughs> this zombie run is just an, uh, a much updated, much more refined version of that same kind of thing. Yeah. It's pacing. Uh, it's giving you the kind of like the okay, cool for two. Because tw- yeah, really, it's, what it's probably doing in the background, it's interval is like, training. Yeah. yeah. What it really is probably doing in the background is it goes okay. Now you need two minutes of just decent running. Now yeah. you need to. Now it's if your heart rates are certain. Right. Now go for the big thing and then come so, back down. Mm-hmm. Funny story about that. Like the so I heard from about Zombies Run like a, a long time ago, and yeah. and I was like, oh yeah, I'm I'm like super in. So I downloaded the app, and the first time out, they don't tell you what the adjustment is. So like you're going right, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, there's zombies behind you, and I'm like, oh, I really got to pick it up. I died because I like got a stitch, <laughs> you know. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna get away, and then at the end of it, they were like, I'm like, oh, I can't go anymore. Yeah. You know, first run out on my 30, 30 minute mission, and and, and they're like, yeah, you just got eaten, and you should start over. That's <laughs> great. I, I have to get that because one of the little it's sto- super fun stories that I tell myself about why I run is like. Like I imagine that I'm running from fascists, and I got to get to the next. I mean, it's dark, sure. but it's like sure. got to get to the next town and mm-hmm. whatever, and then I make mm-hmm. it home, or you know, like I save my family, right? So it's a it's a little story that I tell myself to, because I, I when I first started running, I was like, oh, I'm dying. Why am I doing this? And you got to make yourself stop saying why. That's yeah, like, yeah, right. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. But no, yeah. and not at all. But that's 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 what it was. And then then I found the rhythm, and it's like, why am I why am I still running? Why do I keep going? <laughs> to you know to live. To escape you know? the fascists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to, because mm-hmm. the fascists are coming. That's They're awesome. Up. So let's switch gears. We've got we have maybe uh, ten minutes left on this break here on this part. I want to switch to the polar opposite end of this expe- of this experience. And when people t- talk about wearables, usually they think about, you know, the stuff that counts your steps and that's great. But there's also all different kinds of wearable technology. There's the Google Glass stuff and the HoloLens and all these other things. And wearables in this category are also going a very different direction where we're having all of these, you know, virtual reality is moving forward very fast right now. Augmented reality is moving forward very fast. Um, I know, Jake, that you were poking around on the internet and shared a couple links, and I think you found something that kind of got you interested. It was about Facebook specifically, I think. Yeah, and let me just pull up the article here. Mm-hmm. So I'm. Not just By the way, while he does that, that, how do you guys feel about the new Facebook like button thing that literally dropped today as of us recording this? Yeah, I was yeah. told about it while we were sitting in the green room. The the like from what I can tell, it's like there's different emojis so i've used it yeah choose well we did an episode on this like, um i don't know a couple months ago and actually dylan's out here in the audience he helped me make a vine about it just saying we made is, a really awesome vine but it was the it was the dislike button yes that's right so, this is what they were talking about facebook gets um, you know people kind of said oh well, there's only like buttons we want a dislike button what if someone says you know i didn't pass the driver's test but you want to show empathy or something yes. like you yeah. don't want to dislike it it gets complicated. You say, yeah. "Oh, no, you suck." Wait, no, that's not what it. You know, right? Yeah. My serial uh, you, serial killer next door neighbor killed my cat. Right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thumbs up because I support you. Well, that's <laughs> yeah. weird. You know, it gets weird. Uh-huh. So they were. Facebook always said we're never going to make a dislike button because that's not where they. That's not where they wanted to go with that. Yeah. They essentially created a reaction button. Yeah. So there's the thumbs up now. I'm so sorry. Pardon me. There's the thumbs up, and you click it, and it gives you a like. Mm-hmm. But if you hold it. 
it brings up a like, a love, and then essentially, um, essentially emoticons, like a happy about it, sad about it, angry about it. And there might be one more in there. There's like a wow. wow. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we did that yeah just like a, wow. a big reaction. Wow. wow. And I used it a few times today already. It's great. I mean, oh. I think it was the right thing to do. Yeah, there's an angry one, a crying You're... one, a surprised one, and then uh, a laughing and a heart. Yeah, a heart. somebody, uh, when I tweeted about being on this and it, I used if this, then that, and it went to Facebook, my friend of course. hearted it instead of giving it the thumbs up. I was like, it's happening. We it's, got love. It's all mm-hmm. happening. <laughs> We got more than a like. So anyway, um, um, uh, Jake. Yeah. Yeah, I got it. So I think virtual reality and this kind of conversation is is on a lot of people's minds. They're talking about it because there was a meeting, a uh, mobile world congress in Barcelona. A bunch of people, a bunch of tech companies gathered together to kind of show off the new VR um, and, and talk about that stuff. And there's actually, I don't know if you guys have seen this and we don't have an asset here, but there's this kind of really cryptic, creepy image of Mark Zuckerberg walking down the, like a row of people and everyone else is just plugged in, right? They've Whoa. got their like goggles like on maybe, maybe and he's hun- got this big grin and it's like, is it he, he's the smartest guy in the room. It might be hundreds of people. Yeah. yeah it's thousands even. It's a huge, yeah. huge conference. And so room. people were kind of going off like, oh, we have like, this is like the people farm, you know, they're, you know, kind of these, uh, you were saying something before how your, um, wearable kind of pings you or like reminds you if you're not active. And I think Apple does this as well. It's like 50 minutes if you're sitting, right. They're like, Hey, you should be mobile. <laughs> Get up, do something. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyways, a lot of people are kind of talking about it. And, and really, the article that I was looking at, it's on futurism. Um, essentially, they're just kind of saying, hey, Facebook is, we knew they acquired Oculus Rift, which is a VR company, um, and kind of revisiting that. And they're also just talking about the fact that, look, this conference with the amount of like tech giants that are showing up with their new things, this is kind of the hot topic that people are talking about right now is, is this is kind of the next stage. And Facebook obviously is saying, hey, look, we want to make a social, we want to make, we want to bring virtual reality to social media and how can we do that? Um, And so there's not a lot of details in here, but if we're just thinking about this for a moment and kind of Mark Zuckerberg, you know, he just had a child. So he's, he's in this like very early fatherly stage, probably oversharing like parents do about all of their, you know, the things that their kids are doing. But he was kind of talking about these like memories. And this is where I think it gets a little interesting because he's like, you know, when, when my, Maybe yeah, sibling. no, I remember this. It's a paraphrase. Yeah, he basically said like a couple generations ago when someone learned how to walk, they right. wrote it down in a book. Yep, it goes in the journal. And then a few years, you know, maybe a decade later, right, It's a, there's a picture. And then there's a video. And he's like, what? You know, what I want for my daughter is I want to relive that experience because I want it to be 3D. I want to be able to kind of go back to that memory and visit it again or so, yeah. kind of share that like right. yeah. share that with everyone where they can kind of put on their gear and experience this or something probably other than the baby steps or you have the um, moment where like you record it with your 360 3D 360 yep. camera yep. you record the moment with your camera the baby starts walking and then you can send that file to your grandma or grandpa yep. that's on the other side of the country and they can just step into the room and they can be, be there. in the moment yep Wait, but does grandma have to have an uh, Oculus? Well, she would. And of that's course. why Facebook is trying to make sure every single person has an Oculus Rift in a couple of years. Like yes. they're, they're, I am speculating, but they, when you start tracking them right now, they're getting dangerously close to saying that we, they might just start giving them away in, in like eight years. You know oh what boy. I mean? Th- that's yeah. not. That is not record. That is nothing. But they're that mm-hmm. aggressive with it. Yeah. That they well, kinda, their price point's a little higher right now. Right now yeah. it is. VR is concerned. We just correct, talked about it a few weeks ago. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I'm a little skeptical because um, what you know what what's the equipment that you need? Like it's already like when baby takes um, first steps, we don't always have the like you know holding onto the edge of the couch, wobbling, and like you fumble and you take out your phone and maybe you get that right on video. Maybe you get it on video, but you don't even see it in real life because you're playing with the technology. Right. But what is, you know, what is the apparatus that you need? Like, hold so, on, baby, don't walk. Let me go get my VR Oculus. Oh, no, you're Rift, absolutely right. Uh, Zuckerberg three thousand. Right. And what it is right now is there's three sixty cameras, and they kind of look like spheres, and you basically hold them like this, and there's like a thing. You know what I mean? How how many? What's that? How many do we do? Like, like if we want to do this right, so we got Just a baby. One. We yeah. got a baby. If you're doing 2D, if you're doing 2D but 360 video, so okay. 2D where you can't just walk around the whole room. There's a lot of technology right now that will let you record in 360, and then the math, and then actually there's like YouTube videos. There's hundreds of YouTube videos that you can watch right now, and just kind of 
pan around, you know? We need a new uh, initiative. Instead of one laptop per child, we need one Oculus Rift per child. Like, the baby is born, you get the 3D if camera. I, yeah. If I just, had just, to, just if you want to know the truth, it. Yeah. Yeah. for better or for worse, if I had to guess, that's the trajectory Facebook has right now. I think they might still be 10 years out, but that's like really what they're thinking. And so, yeah, fine, right now it might be a single way to record, and maybe you can just watch it in 360. And I'm not necessarily for or against this. This is just kind of what's happening. So if you want it to be in 3D, you're going to have to have two of those things, right? Obviously, you know what I mean? But really what might start happening is it's going to become sensors in your house that are just installed like plumbing and electricity and everything else that records the three-dimensional geometry of your entire house all the time. Mm -hmm. And then you can say, you can say, hey, Siri or house or Google, hey, uh, record that moment that just happened. Hey, oh my gosh, my child just stepped, send it to mom. And, you know, the whole house is recording everything yeah. all the time. I mean, that's probably what's going to be going down. Leaked first 3D yeah. VR <laughs> sex tape. Yeah. Oh. That's a whole different thing that's you going heard on it right here now. First. Oh, man. Mm-hmm. What's the hashtag for that? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, Mark, but it's going to have your name in it. <laughs> Hashtag we ruined VR. <laughs> so I don't want to derail too much. Yes. But, um, you know, I started thinking about virtual reality and stuff like that. And it's a tough sell for me personally. Like, I, I, all the companies think we're going to have these things strapped to our faces in five years. It's a little hard for me to swallow that. But it does seem like it's going that way. Now, are we now? So we're, we're wearing, we're GPSing our bike rides, but we're sitting in chairs with our VR headsets. Like, where does this go? That's kind I don't of what know. I was thinking, too. It seems really, it's like, go experience this, but you don't actually have to do anything to experience this. this. Where a lot of the wearables right now are like, no, yeah, go be adventurous and kind exactly. of share and inspire other people to kind of do something similar, maybe. Um, I don't know. Oh, Crystal Lee's got an idea, I think. Uh, yeah, so actually near the end of one of the other articles, I was throwing around the, the TPN sure. back channel. Um, a couple of different wearable companies. I want to say one of them was somebody from Jawbone, and then the other one was maybe the CEO of Mio or one of those. Um, they said the next step is implants. And it makes sense that it would be that for virtual reality as well. Now, it'll probably take longer for virtual reality, right? Because you think about the Oculus Rift, it's quite big and bulky compared to like a little Fitbit. But it's a small step from your Fitbit being something you wear on your wrist to something that's in your wrist. Right, because we can already do that. We, we have. The bat- How do you charge it? The, so, okay, I can't remember the name of it, but there is this tech right now. It looks like jewelry. You basically plug it into your vein, and it charges off of the flow of your blood. Mm-hmm. Now, if you combine that with your Fitbit, put that in something. Like, think about how much blood goes through your wrist, right? Yeah. Implant that there. Is it a blood turbine? Is it like a wind turbine? But it's like a mini so Niagara Falls. I don't really know the details on like sure. the tech of how it works. I I, I just saw sure, this. Sure, I was article. kind of putting you on the spot there. I right, but um, <laughs> but yeah, like that is a thing, and people are working on it. And then your own body would charge it, and then that's that. And virtual reality. Think about it. You could, you know, just. Implant it in your brain. Maybe when people are turning it on and off, you'll have something like from the movies where they're like. Sure. Well, yeah, I mean, we're stepping way out there, but you're absolutely right. And the, the logic of this is it's a screen in front of your face, then it's your glasses, then it's your contacts, then it's just directly into the brain. And that's a conversation for another time, but, yeah. I'm, but I'm glad we're going there. Mark, we mm-hmm. basically have to get going to break here, but this entire world that's happening with wearables right now, do you have any kind of closing thoughts about it that you'd like to share with us? Any of the things that we've been chatting about here? What, how does it affect you? Yeah, yeah. It's, um, you know, I think about um, technology in in general, and ha- so Donna Haraway helped to coin this phrase "cyborg," um, and um, essentially, um, we're already cyborgs in in this way that we've fused and, and merged. But you've got a phone in your hand, I've right there. I've got a phone cyborg. in my hand, yeah, right? Where but, is. but she, she, yeah, she makes the point that it's not even these high tech kinds of things. If you go back 150, 160 years, there was cyborg, um, cyborg cyborgs, attack, cyborgs, <laughs> incoming cyborgs. Sorry. There was, um, we didn't have right shoes and left shoes. So Mm -hmm. even tennis shoes, um, glasses that we put on our face, we sort of take these things as sort of for granted and and low low tech kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Um, It's still tech. It's it's still tech for sure. I was just looking at this um, quote also by Lori Anderson, who's a performance artist. She says, technology is the campfire around which we tell our stories. 
So, can you say that again? Yeah, I'd love to. Technology is the campfire around which we tell our stories. So essentially, it's not, you know, we're still humans and we still are using these things to figure out, like, like you were saying, Jake, you know, we collect the data. We want to know the data. And that's what we use to tell the story. That's mm-hmm. how we create meaning. Um, and so technology is, I mean, that's just a fancy word for, for tool. I mean, it's true. It's hard to imagine, um, you know. Well, like a shovel was a technology. A, at a shovel, point. Yeah. yeah. I mean, me- you still know, is. like that's me- true. It's, still, it's a good tool. Yeah, metal. Um, all of those were, um, you know, major um, developments in the, the evolution of man and humans and in, in technology. So, mm-hmm. um, so I like to take the really, really big picture view on that and say, yeah, let's let's see, but let's remember that it's still about um, humanity and um, uh, creating meaning and telling our stories, even if we're not, if we become like Kurzweil um, along the lines of what Krista Lee was talking about, he says by 2040, so this is the idea of singularity, that we will be more uh, technologically uh, man-made based than organic material. So we'll have more of these kind of nano things, implants, uh, floating ar- around under our skin and our body on our body than we have um, this kind of organic material. And I think we're moving towards that. Will we be human then? I think we probably will still identify with humanity, but we right. won't be the same kind of human that was around 100 years ago, 1,000 mm-hmm. years it's ago. It's the same converse. It's, it's very tricky. And honestly, I'm so happy you're talking about this because the entire goal of this very podcast, not just this episode, just us getting together every week and talking is 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 about celebrating technology, but but always trying to explore how it affects and how do we maintain humanity through it. Mm-hmm. And we usually find some pretty exciting answers. And we talked about some really great things today as well. Um, Mark, this was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Great fun. Thanks, we're gonna everybody. we're gonna take a break and come back in part three. If anybody has any thoughts or questions, we'd love to hear from them. I'm thinking Crystal Lee might even have a couple ideas. Um, we talked about so many things that I'm not sure there might be a few and there may may, may not be too many. But this was a, a real treat, and thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Um, if people want to um, find you on the internet, they can do that. Before we'll do it again in part three. But for now, yeah, my all of my social media handles are Mark Tasman, Mark like the artist, Mark Chagall, Tasman like the Tasmanian Devil, M A R C T A S M A N. Wonderful. All right, well, we're going to cut to break and we'll come right back. Fantastic. Thank you. (laughs) All right, and we're back. Look at that, Mark. (laughs) I love it. This man works the crowd. This man works the crowd. Uh, Mark, we've been having a wonderful time with you tonight. Me ta- too. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's really been a pleasure. And um, we usually a typical episode for us is really only usually like two parts. Um, well, actually, no, now it's three, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, we When we do our live shows, we like to get to know the guest, expand on the conversation a little bit. And then, of course, you know, all these people come to listen to us. We kind of like to, to see if they have anything to say. So in the third part here, we do a little bit of a, it's just kind of an open forum for anybody in the room. It's almost a, a talk back or questions and things like that. So we've talked about a lot of things. We've talked about wearables. We've talked about um, long dis- long-term art projects. We've talked about just what it means for technology and humanity and all that kind of stuff. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw it out to Crystal Lee for now. And if anybody has a thought at any point, you can just put your hand up real quick. It's okay. We'll keep track and um, we can walk around. But Crystal Lee, how has tonight's conversation been affecting you? In what ways has it been <laughs> affecting you? Um, so actually, it makes me really curious of something that honestly I was curious before. Okay. So, um, Mark, obviously, I knew you before tonight um, from working here at UWM. And I'm really curious on your career trajectory because I know I saw the TEDx talk you gave and you had the video of you um, programming, like genius programmer when you were, what, 10 or something? 12? 12 12-year-old computer Um, genius. So yeah, so you go from that to to these art projects and and this 10-year selfie thing and and the 10,000 steps. And, and then lecturing in, in the jam school at UWM, and all of these, like each one of these things to me seems almost like it could be a separate career. And I'm wondering how all of this fits together for you. It's a good story, isn't it? It is a great story. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, when I was uh, programming or when I had this Apple IIe in 1984, 
I was really trying to invent Photoshop. I was really essentially interested in using a computer to try to make some kind of art with it. I didn't have a modem back then. Sure. Um, but, um, and the code that we would put in, like I check out books from the library to enter this code and I would make games, but really like the, the sort of my life's work as a preteen was to figure out how to take high resolution graphics and get them to print out. It wasn't really possible on the Apple to e there were programs like print shop what was the result was it it wasn't like 320 by 240 was it it was i th- think it was the high resolution mode i think was h264 that's coming into my that could be mine so it could be 264 pixels across i know what it is uh, rgb and q basic is 320 by 240 that's what i'm uh-huh. thinking of right but still it's not much to work with no. right not much to work with and so i i when i was in college i got sort of um repulsed by computers because they ate one too many um, English papers that oh. I was procrastinating <laughs> on. And then I've, I've spent a lot of time um, in um, school, first as an engineer in engineering school, uh, and then a psychology major and theater, art history, uh, and art, and settled on photography. And that was a, that was a, a good um, sort of tying together of all those things. Mm-hmm. Um, I talked a little bit before about the how I was interested in performance and um, and making things and interacting with um, with culture, and so I don't know am I am I tying it up? Yeah. So uh, um, and of course teaching is one of the things that I I, I like very much because it's um, it's also to me feels uh, like making something. We're having a conversation. I, I suppose it is like I am in the business of uh, creating meaning even if we don't yet know what the story is, we're sort of on a quest. We're uh, doing research to figure out what things are meaningful and why those things are meaningful to us. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. It's great. Uh, <laughs> Crystal Lee's caught mid-tweet right now, I think. Mm. She's transcribing. Uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. You only get 144 of those bits. I know, I know. Oh, but this is a tweet storm. I'm going like crazy. Actually, no, I, <laughs> I, I was absolutely listening, and the reason I had to stop to tweet is because, um, it, for, I'm sorry, totally egotistical reason, I started hearing that I went from this major to this major to the mis- this major, and I'm like, oh, it was just like me. I'll be okay, too, then later. <laughs> <laughs> yes, got it. Yeah. Thought, yeah. I see. Does anybody else in the audience have any thoughts about some of the things we've talked about tonight? Wearables and such? Oh, i got a gentleman over here. Oh, I'm sorry. oh just kick everything over yeah, as you go, Crystal Lee. Yeah, hi. I'm Tom hi. Gill. And, uh, I was, I'm kind of one of the things that really fascinates me about the, the photo project. Um, and you were telling the story, and we were all kind of following it. And then, and then you kind of went back, and, or maybe uh, you did, and said, they they were photographs they were yeah you know, they were items and then suddenly it, it changed for me mm-hmm. to think about these thousands and thousands of photos and the shoe boxes and everything and, and i think for me and i don't know how old you have to be to be able to call yourself old school <laughs> but uh, i'm a journaler i'm a journaler and so i i write and i have these many many steno books from back when i was uh, quite young and to me just seeing the stack of them represents something. And I could reach in and pull out a slice of my life. And, uh, and, and also something that wasn't talked about a lot today, but this, this idea of time. You know, that we're kind of collecting time in a way, in a, you know, in a capsule or whatever. And so with my steno book, sometimes I'll go ahead and write a note to myself. Hey, future man. <laughs> and, and I'm kind of in a, in, a, in a certain mood when I'm doing that. And sometimes when I get to that page, I could be in a totally different place, in a dark place, and then I get this message from myself. It's really kind of freaky. It's, uh, yeah. But I also notice that oh. Facebook, to me, is kind of a scrapbook. You know, not only for myself, and now, recently, they started doing this thing where they, they show you anniversary things or put together these little stories, and I mean, how many people were scrapbooking before this? And I found, interestingly, I mean, I do some Facebook, but I found that my journals, which used to be primarily text, have now become collectors of way more data. Like I work out or whatever, put my rowing times in there, put business cards in there, and they've really evolved alongside the technology, even though I'm firmly planted in this old way of moving the pen across the paper. So I just wondered you know, if that could be a question. It would be in this push forward of technology, 
how much of the archaic is, is coming along for the ride and, and embellished and even going to hold its place forever, like a book. Yeah. Still yeah. does. Yeah, yeah, I love that, Tom. I, I, I very much identify with this idea of journaling. Um, for me, that's, that was one other aspect of taking the picture every day. It was, uh, I called it a, a kind of a visual diary that I was creating a visual journal. Um, but I also, you know, so I, I'm an artist, but I teach in the journalism department, journalism, advertising, and media studies. Um, but so when I teach a photojournalism class, I, I break it open. I say, this is not just uh, going to be about the professional practice of, you know, taking photographs for newspapers and periodicals. I say, this is like, let's break it down. What does journalism mean? And it means to do those things, to record um, those details every day and to, to amass those uh, observations and recollections. Um, so um, when I was doing the Polaroid project and I saw my sort of my imagined competitors doing this digital stuff, I was like, I've got this body, you know, like after the EMP, you know, after the terrorists set off the EMP and wipe out all the <laughs> electronic data in the world, you know, I'll still have these stacks and stacks. And for me, it was also an analogy. It was like I was creating a body, a physical body. Um, the Polaroids themselves had a physical body, and they don't last forever either. There's chemicals in there that actually start to eat the eat around the the, the container, the you know the Polaroid Absolutely. material. Um, and so those things became a body, and I and so me, my physical body in relation to it, like I felt this connection to to the body, the physicality. Um, and I think it's something that we have to pay attention to, and maybe it is an old school idea, but um, that's a really great observation. Uh, I don't, I don't know that people are thinking about how important physical touch is to us in the in the kind of coming world of virtual reality. Mm -hmm. Digital hoarder. Digital hoarder. <laughs> yeah. Digital hoarder. Well, I I have Guilty. a couple friends who who um, who I have met along the way where it's just hard drives and hard drives and hard drives and they don't want to delete anything and everything, you know, um, and that's, maybe there's versions of that. Terabytes of stuff saved mm -hmm. sometimes. Yeah. Thousands of things. Uh, I yeah, think there's that? also something rewarding in being able to like put together your own timeline yourself by hand because it, not only is it like you've done the accomplishment of getting through that day or doing whatever you did that day, it's also like at the end of it all, I also documented it. You know, I have this photo and I, yeah. all the, I kept all these things and I put it together and I saved it. It's just like taking the photo every day. It's like I did my day and also I took this photo. And that's to kind of like celebrate it, document it, and keep it and have it's that's like this is what I did to submit well, it yourself. And I think the interaction with the digital or the, the physical manifestation of, of these, whether it's a project or a journal or all these different things, it is a different experience. You know, it's not a you can't search that document in the same way that you could something that you wrote online, mm -hmm. you know, we're not going to get the reminder to it's go true. back. It's yeah. true. So yeah. we have to actually take that. We have to make a conscious effort that we're going to go back into that space that we were, you know, I, I remember I was actually like pulling out an old journal and, and reading just some wild things to my wife randomly. I'm like, you have no idea what you're getting into. And clearly <laughs> neither did I. Cause like, Whoa, you know, but like that was a process and it wasn't, it wasn't Facebook saying, Hey, you should go do this. It was just, something, you know, I had yeah. made that effort, but I actually do think the Facebook um, sharing kind of memories thing is cool. Um, you mean I, when like sometimes you log in, it'll say you, you did this seven yeah, years ago today. Like, do you want to tell anyone about it? But yeah. generally it's just kind of like, oh yeah, like I did. And, and sometimes they're just really random photos. I had one pop up but today. That's I, had, a great... I had long hair. It was like no, 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 seven years ago. And I was like, <laughs> oh, I almost forgot about that time. David, Don't why didn't you share it? <laughs> because I had long hair. <laughs> <laughs> right. We're going to keep that one. We'll yeah. save that yeah. one. Yeah. But anyway, that yes, up. that's it's true. It's it's and it's interesting too because, you know, I've had moments in my life where maybe it's, a, it's the piece that you do have the physical thing and it can get put in the wrong folder or it gets put on the wrong stack mm -hmm. and you go insane trying to find it and yeah. you go, "Oh, if it was digital, all I got to do is say the file name and even if I put it in the wrong folder, it'll show up." And so for me, it's a very complicated balance of both experiences. Mm -hmm. You yeah. assume that everyone remembers their file names. I was going to say, I'm yeah. crazy because oh. I have lost things that I know is saved on one of my hard drives. Oh, sure, and it's like, it was that's the thing about file names that are so important because if you just name it as like thing number 1, well, you know, paper, oh, yeah. paper, uh, science paper 
Oh, two. Scan oh, zero, oh, zero, zero. Scan oh, zero, zero, zero. God. I have countless, like, art projects or, or, like, Photoshop files that are just keyboard smashes. Yeah. I was too, I had to, like, save it really quick. So I have, like, a whole folder of just, like, two. It's very unhygienic of you. I know. I'm going to go back out to the audience in a second here. But even here at TPN, when all of our files that we record, there's an entire code. There's, like, a basically a 10-character code of what the show is what the cut is what the take is and in that way even if you aren't if even if you're like oh i need that thing from tuesday that was the third take of something you can deduce the name and hopefully find it mm -hmm. and so that's that's when the file names do work but anyway i want to get back on track do we have any other thoughts out in the audience right now oh we got a hand over there he's got a brain thought stick the talk stick in his face Hi, uh, my, oh, I'll further away. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, loud. Um, my name is Dylan Schneider. Um, I guess, I, uh, and I, up until recently, was a uh, graduate student here at UWM. I just uh, graduated, so hooray for me. No. Nice, nice. <laughs> no, I, no, no more. Um, so I was just thinking about when we were looking at the pictures drawn um, by, by bicycle or walking route, it's kind of a callback to maybe the Nazca lines in Peru, you know, where people, the, the Native American people, were actually drawing these large megalithic mm. things, uh, but only the gods could see them at that time, and mm. so we only discovered them once we found planes, but here we have this sort of like more ethereal thing where you can't see it unless you're actually looking on the computer and stuff like that, and I, I just, that, that uh, was an interesting kind of, uh, parallel for me and so you're absolutely right i'm kind of geeking out over that that's a really cool comparison mm -hmm. you know thinking about how like the i guess godly we've come to be like oh we can see the entire earth now yeah we can chart From everything this, oh right yeah right. yeah um well or or we're creating art for the digital overlords oh yeah <laughs> i mean if you want to do it as a metaphor kind of guns. yes you mm -hmm. know what i mean oh we'll map out this thing will look like a dog or a pig or a bear or whatever because a mound goes a certain way or things are dug a certain way mm -hmm. but it's never really quite seen because you're never up that high with the current yeah. technology of that time we well in a way gps is similar yeah. some guy some guy riding his bike in a certain pattern mm -hmm. to the person who's watching it go by maybe this is what you were touching on dylan that's just a guy on a bike. He's not seen the the bear or the pig or whatever until, and even yeah. the planes aren't seeing that until you're using the filter or the technology of the GPS. That's, that's in, the only time you see yeah, it. It is very similar. Yeah. yeah, you need the technology of the plane or the technology of the GPS, you know, to make it all come together. I mean, it's cool. Yeah. I don't know. It just seemed like an interesting. Well, I, that's the first thing that that brought to my mind. So absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so cool. it's it's yeah great that the idea of that it would be invisible to people. Uh, I mean, much the same way that a lot of this kind of social media is, and then that there is something, something else, some other audience, some mm -hmm. unseen, either at a different time or a different place. Mm -hmm. It was, um, I, I was uh, thinking of all these song lyrics that uh, had to do with um, the internet and um, technology, and one of them is from um, St. Vincent from uh, 2014. She's got a song called Digital Witnesses. If only Tony was still here. Oh. Oh, uh, yeah. Yes. Our uh, old like, cast member had a big old, yeah. big old creative crush on her. Yes. Yeah. Well, I do too. She, she says, Digital Witnesses, what's the point of even sleeping? If I can't show it, if you can't see it, if, sorry, if I can't show it, you can't see me, what's the point of doing anything? And that uh, sort of speaks to this sort of tension between um, the kind of I guess a kind of digital narcissism, like I'm doing it so other people can see me, or mm -hmm. you know, why am I really, you know, writing these things down? Like Tom, with all your journals to yourself, you're you're not like you're not tweeting them every day, like oh, process. yeah, process. Um, yeah. somebody anonymously would like to point out that also crop circles. <gasps> Also, crop yep. circles <laughs> and burial mounds here in, in this. Continent. I saw some strange reaction yeah. behind you back there. I don't know who it was. Well, and but. think about it. I mean, really. <laughs> so the the guys they found who did this, and it's a hoax. But that's quite the hoax to be putting on. Where again, you have to wait until somebody is like flying over to actually see what it is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and they would use yeah. you know when when the, uh, the people who do the crop circles, you know, there's 
little documentaries here and there about how they can use strings and wood and boards and things to make sure that their geometry is correct. So it's mm-hmm. even as they're creating it, it's obviously in the abstract. And they're usually doing it in the dark, and it's not until <laughs> someone goes over and they see it. Yeah. What's something just happened there, Mark? Yeah. No, I'm just thinking about all of the kind of all of this other kind of technology to use. You said to get the geometry correct. Um, oh, you know, like ah. these. Ge- I mean, geometry is a technology in and of itself. Like Let's flip it back the other way in a very practical way. I know that a lot of farmers now actually use GPS in their tractors when they're mapping out their grow patterns and things like that. Mm. Very that's, nice. That's a fact. Yeah. And I think. Oh, yeah, well, no, no, please. Yeah, no. Yeah, I was thinking of these other artists. There's an artist. Um, um, we're going to get her uh, to come here in this fall. Okay. Um, She's an artist who combs uh, Google Earth and looks for objects, and she takes screenshots of them from Google Earth and cleans them up. And so, you, you know, you might see the Eiffel Tower from um, Google Earth. Um, so it's, it's a, s- sort of like what, what you're talking about, the kind of drawings for the gods, but now the people are in, you know, God's spaceship or in God's eye and can yeah. see and are collecting the little trinkets that the humans have made on Earth. Sure. <laughs> yeah, looking back down. Actually, yeah. if I remember correctly, Jake, can't you Google Earth you sitting outside a cafe in Taiwan? J- Jake himself, the real yes, man? Yes, yes. Oh, well, I mean, it was Jake Google Maps. Or Google Maps. I was close. Oh, yeah. Street, yeah. Google like Maps or Street View. Yeah. Was I don't know if the cafe is still there, but at, yeah, at least for now. I saw the thing going out by. I was like, oh, yeah. Hello. <laughs> oh, you hey, saw Google. Like, the Google car going yeah. by? And I didn't even know. It was pretty sweet. But then after, I could find myself. And you showed up. Man, yeah. there was one, blur, there was one that face? went. Yeah, I'm blurred. I'm blurred. You're blurred out, but it's yeah. you. The, you I saw still, one here in Milwaukee a few years back during the summer, and I chased it for blocks. I was like, I want to show up on Google Street. <laughs> please, please. And I remember for like about three or four months, I'd log in and I'd check. I'd kind of go, vroom, 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 and you know, look through. I never found myself, and then I gave it. It might just be like disembodied legs, yeah, like just, in the shot. <laughs> yeah. It's like my hand You're stuck in that panel when they stitch stitching. it together. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm like really stretched out. <laughs> anyway, um, I don't know. Maybe we'll get going here. Unless anybody has any final thoughts, any any final things they want to share, that would be all. All right. I'm not seeing too much action, so I think we'll end it here. This has been a huge, this has been a meaty episode, and we've talked about a lot of things, Mark. Mm-hmm. And again, it's been a real treat, and thank you for taking time out of your schedule to yeah, be here with us tonight. thank you, David, V, and Jake. Yeah, this is fun. Mm-hmm. Great fun, and everybody out there. Wonderful. <laughs> so listeners. we'd also like to... Um, Real quick, before we actually totally get out of here, we of course want to thank UWM and the Digital Humanities Lab, and um, we also want to thank ABC Audio and Video for giving us some of the equipment that it took to uh, make the show tonight. And last, last but not least, let's go through the uh, ranks here and um, share our, our Twitters and our whatevers we want. So V, if people want to have more conversations with you about the things we talked about tonight, where can they find you? They can find me at bear underscore Annika. Fantastic. And I'll jump actually over to Jake. Jake, if people want to chat with you about your um, street view poses, they can do that where? Uh, on Twitter at Critical Owl. Fantastic. And Mark, and you, you already shared in part two, but for people who might just be tuning in it's a for weird, the Q&A. weird yeah. expression um, where can people find everything they want to learn about you yes I am Mark Tasman and I use the very obscure handle Mark Tasman <laughs> wait a second wait a second there's got to be an underscore in there something. no underscore yeah. just M-A-R-C-T-A-S-M-A-N I, I was I guess I was a pioneer Nice. They're in the early days. <laughs> yeah. Yep, yep, absolutely. Fantastic. Well, uh, we love it when people tweet the show at Technophiles Pod. People can find us on iTunes, YouTube, Stitcher, and Facebook by searching Technophiles Podcast. They can go uh, to our actual website, technophilespodcast.com, to check out this show or to check out some of the other live shows we've had here at the Digital Humanities Lab. We have a special tab up in our menu specifically for our live shows if people want to check those out. And um, I think that's it. We're back. Normal episode. We're back in the studio next week. And then a month from now, we're here speaking to some people who uh, uh, worked on the Milwaukee Public Museum art exhibit, uh, not art exhibit, the uh, um, old Streets of Old Milwaukee. Streets of Old Milwaukee. It's the executive artistic director and another gentleman who uh, worked they, on the, yeah. they worked on like the beacons and the iPhones and stuff mm-hmm. like that and how it all worked. And that will be here on March 23rd. Also very excited about that. That one's going to be awesome. It's going to be great, and uh, this was also great. And until then, people can tweet me. I'm David Geiser. They can find me on Twitter at Raptor Paint. And have a have a good night, everyone. Yeah. Enjoy. Cool.